uh, just I'll let you know in a minute. Uh, the page is loading. Yes, it has started. Rita, go ahead. Thank you, Ranguli. Good afternoon and welcome to the fourth thematic session of the All India First All India Conference of East Asian Studies, organized by the Institute of Chinese Studies, New Delhi, in collaboration with the Department of International Relations and Governance Studies, Shivnada University. We shall now begin the proceedings of thematic panel four, titled Kaleidoscope Literature and History. Sharing the session is Dr. Geeta Aikini, Associate Professor and Head of the Department of uh, Japanese Studies, Nippon Bhavana, Bhasha Bhavan, Mishra Bharti University. The speakers in this panel are Nidhi Maini, doctoral candidate at the Department of East Asian Studies, Faculty of Social Sciences, University of Delhi, presenting a paper titled Shufu no Tomo, Dressing Up the Interwar Japanese Women. Mayang Sharma, doctoral candidate at the Center for Japanese Studies, School of Language, Literature and Culture Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, presenting on the depiction of Maya in Endo Shusaku's Hokai Kawa, The Case of Isobi and Kiguchi. Cherry Hitkari, master's student at the Department of East Asian Studies, Faculty of Social Sciences, University of Delhi, presenting a paper titled Constructing the Homeworld and Alien World, Understanding North Korea Through Propaganda Posters. Ashna Joy, doctoral candidate at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, presenting on the survival of Mongolian culture under China, analysis between Qing Dynasty and People's Republic of China. And finally, Shreya Mamgi, doctoral candidate at the Department of East Asian Studies, Faculty of Social Sciences, University of Delhi, presenting on Korean collaboration and Japanese colonization from 1876 to 1945, a political legacy and assessment. To lead the discussion in this session, we have with us Dr. Tariq Sheikh, Assistant Professor of Japanese at the School of Arab and Asian Studies at the in English and Foreign Languages University, Hyderabad. Before I invite the chair to begin the proceedings, I would like to remind our audience that all participants except the speakers will be muted during the session. You can post your queries to the speakers in the chat box or use the raise hand option during the Q&A. Please unmute yourself only when called upon to do so by the chair. I will now invite the chair to begin the proceedings. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, very good afternoon to all. I thank the organizers for inviting me to be a part of this first All India Conference of East Asian Studies organized by the Institute of Chinese Studies, New Delhi and the Department of International Relations and Governance Studies, Shiv Nada University. I welcome all to this session titled Kaleidoscope, Literature and History. The session has five presenters dealing with various topics on Japan, South Korea, North Korea, and Mongolia. We have Dr. Tariq Sheikh of the Department of Asian Studies, the English and Foreign Languages University Hyderabad has discussion. My request to all the presenters to complete their presentation within 10 minutes. Questions for all the presentations will be taken up after the comments from the discussion. Requesting all to put their questions in the chat box. The first presenter of this session is Nidhi Maini. She is a doctoral candidate of the Department of East Asian Studies, University of Delhi. Her topic is Shufu no Tomo, Dressing Up the Interwar Japanese Women. Na uh, Nidhi, please. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I think I'm both audible and visible to everyone, right? Yeah. Yeah, you're audible. Now, may I request the organizers to please share the PPT? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay. Okay. yeah thank you so much. Uh, uh, first of all, a uh, heartfelt thanks to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to be able to present my paper on this esteemed platform. The title of my paper is Shufu Notomo Dressing Up the Interwar Japanese Women where Shufu no Tomo happens to be one of the most commercially successful magazines of interwar Japan, where Shufu no Tomo means the housewife's friend or the housewife's companion. 
Now, interwar Japanese magazines have been uh, you know, debated upon for various reasons regarding the history, regarding the literature, regarding the kind of content they talked about, but no one really has talked about the role that they played in delving the identity of the woman as a consumer, specifically because of the you know, peripheral position of the Japanese women. Uh, in the Japanese society, and also because of the dark view of the interwar Japanese economy. So the objective of this paper is to view Shufu no Tomo from the prism of consumption history of Japan, and to see how Shufu no Tomo actually uh, kind of propelled the growth of the cosmetic industry, the sewing machine industry, in a way also kind of making the women, not just the modern girl, but the, all the spectrum of Japanese women really modern in all senses, making them ready to be dressed up and on the go. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, consumption, thy name is woman. That's a very famous dictum. And we, as we also know, Adam Smith's maze, the product, the, the aim of all production is nothing but consumption. However, when we talk about consumption, women is seen as a person, you know, enjoying the money earned by the breadwinner, that is the men. And their role as the agency of consumption is highly overlooked, not just in Japan, but across all the societies. And what really induces women to consume? It is the information of the, about the consumer goods. If we talk about today's times, the information is just a, a click away. However, when we talk about 19th and 20th century, the early 20th century, there were cultural and moral restrictions in place and women had no access to what the effervescent consumer culture had to offer. And the only window to this, the open sesame moment for the women were the women magazines, which uh, started you know, in American, the Western societies. And once uh, late, we all know about the ladies home journal, uh, which was kind of the model for the women magazines which came up in the other parts of the world. And it was due to these magazines that women got the information about all the consumer goods which modern economy had to offer, and they became agency of consumption. The next slide, please. Uh, these are the two writers, Marjorie Ferguson and Penny Tinkler, who've talked about the role of the women magazines and why it is important to analyze women magazines to understand the consumption history of an economy where Marjorie Ferguson talks about how a female sex has to be informed about the choices she can make. And it's only by way of magazines one can understand the view of the worldview which is desirable, the possible, and the purchasable. Uh, I'm not reading it as verbatim as this. And Penny Tinker also talks about how women magazines or, or serve as a complex cultural product, and it's important to study them to understand the moorings of the society. And uh, this new approach where people are talking about, where scholars are talking about how to study the objects, the bottom up approach, where seeing the objects, studying the history of the objects, we can see the kind of uh, lives the people who use them uh, lived in those particular eras in the contemporary era, if we talk about. Uh, the next slide, please. Women magazines, some of the reasons which really propel the growth of women magazines in the early 20th century are industrial expansion, rapid urbanization, high levels of literacy for women, leisure and economic independence, whereby women magazines became the catalyst for the consumer culture, which the modern economy had to offer. Japan was not far behind. Uh, upon Meiji Restoration, Japan took everything, uh, you know, it aped the West. It took everything modern it had to offer. And despite being laggard in some instances, I think this not, I mean, the scholars have talked about how publishing culture was one place where Japan was not at all laggard. Uh, embryonic consumption movement, which started in Japan post Meiji Restoration, uh, kind of heightened only because of the women magazines, because women magazines working on the ideals of westernization and modernization informed the women about everything modern which the society had to offer. However, due to the Ryosai Kenbo image, the good wife, wise mother image, which Japanese women, which was the Meiji ideal, uh, the modern girl appeal or the modern girl or the consumerist role of the Japanese women has not been analyzed much. Another reason is also because the Japanese women magazines have been uh, majorly criticized because of their frivolous content, the scandalous articles they ran, the kind of images they showed. So there was always a kind of, uh, you know, it was a kind of, there's a lull over Japanese women magazines role as the propellants of the consumer culture. Next slide, please. Magazines in interwar Japan, if we talk about, there was there were a host of magazines in interwar Japan. Some of the famous ones being Fujin Kuron, Shufu no Tomo, Fujin Kurabu, Jose, Jose Kaizo, and Reizo Kai. Uh, Shufu no Tomo was the biggest uh, commercial success, printing up to 240,000 copies in 1924. Uh, Shufu helped in creating multiple identities. Also, a Shufu way of life, where Shufu means a housewife. 
The interesting part here is we're talking about housewife. We'll see in the, in, the, in the next slide how this name was coined. But Shufu actually kind of dictated a kind of lifestyle, not for the housewife, but for all spectrum of women in Japan. It made women the vanguards of consumption, whereby they compensated for their uh, uh, lower role in society in the arena of consumption by consuming the new goods which the economy had to offer. Next slide, please. Shufu is born. Shufu was born in March 1917. And in principle, the name says Shufu no Tomo, housewife's companion, which means it was directed towards the urban middle class married women. But due to the promotional strategies, due to the sharp acumen of its founder, Ishikawa Takeyoshi, it soon reached hands of the women, uh, working women, the young women, even the men folk for that matter. What's in the name? Well, the name is again because of the Ishikawa Takeyoshi, who had uh, sufficient experience in working with the other magazines as well. And in 1910s, there was a heightened uh, criticism of the magazines like uh, Jogaku Seikai and Seito, which were banned by the conservationists because of their uh, anti Ryosai Kimbo uh, ideology. Uh, taking cue from that, uh, Ishikawa Takeyoshi coined this uh, slogan, which said, Kekkon Shutara Shufu no Tomo. That is, once you're married, it's nothing but Shufu no Tomo. So he based the ideology of this magazine on the ideology of the Ryosai Kenbo. However, the articles which ran in, this, in the magazine were not really directed only towards the housewives, but it talked about love marriages, it talked about sex scandals, it talked about everything modern which was happening in the West. So it kind of towed the line between the Ryosai Kenbo and the modernity in its glossy pages. And that's how working on the uh, the state ideology on one side, and also working on the lines of the Seikatsu Kaizen Undo, the life improvement scheme, which was launched by the government of Japan in the backdrop of the rice riots, where women played a very important role. They wanted to put women as uh, heads of the consumption of the house, whereby by way of uh, rationalized consumption and minimization of wastage, they could run their houses. So Shufu no Tomo ran articles on that account. However, it never talked about the issues in the ground reality. It just gave a preaching tone. And this is how the magazine got a kind of immunity from the state. It was working on both the lines, on the lifestyle, on the, uh, the reform system as well, and also on the Ryosai Kenbo. But on the other hand, the modernity was always there. More of modernity and less of Ryosai Kenbo. Uh, next slide, please. Some of the first which Shufu no Tomo uh, started with, which also became one of those, uh, the platform it was set for the other publications which came in were the pricing. Earlier, the prices were subject to a lot of economic changes, you know, uh, I mean, number of pages, uh, the economic situations. But then Shufu came up with the 50 cent, uh, just one table with one coin, which was very convenient for everybody. Table of contents uh, for all the issues was put in the December issue. So it worked like a home encyclopedia for people. American point system, which worked, uh, which helped to put both the alphanumeric and the Japanese uh, font together, heightened the overall appeal. Increasing use of photographs, more and more of photographs, colored front covers, back covers, the variety of articles which Shufu had to offer. It just made Shufu the one of the best, uh, <clears throat> the friends of uh, the women of Japan. The, the language which was used, Ishikawa Takeo, she was of the opinion, should be very simple, colloquial in style. That's how a friend talks to a friend, right? So that was also a very important uh, uh, strategy uh, followed by Shufu no Tomo. And uh, there was an intimacy, the reader-friendly content, and the way content was placed, the way advertisements were also placed. Along with the article, there was an advertisement. Uh, the back covers and the front covers were not just the covers, but they were a story in itself. Uh, the next slide, please. Magazine club was there where people could write in to the editor. They could comment on the other articles. They could request what they wanted to read. There was a department of counseling where people could uh, seek advice on childcare, on relationships, even on their beauty uh, regimes as well. The prefatory note and editor's diary was, uh, was a done thing. However, this did not have a didactic moralistic approach because they wanted not to sound of a preaching nature, but a friendly approach. So this did not even have any virtual or a visual appeal to it as well. It was rendered in a very small font in the beginning and it was, there was nothing fancy about it. There were a variety of uh, supplements, at times even 15 of them dealing with different things. Uh, the Department of Cultural Programs was set in which ran exhibitions, contests all over Japan, moving exhibitions where people or the readers, even the non-readers could attend them. Uh, there were massive ad revenue for Shufu no Tomo, which again uh, led to the establishment of in-house ad agencies for a lot of magazines. The mail order system, uh, 
in this system, there was a perforated sheet was inserted in every issue of the magazine where uh, the goods, which really couldn't uh, uh, have, which really didn't have a big ad revenue, could place their small ads priced only at 10 yen each. And the readers could offer it, could kind of uh, uh, place an order for these uh, products. The readers living in the rural area, the readers who did not have access to departmental stores, they could buy these from the Shufu's in-house agency and they were delivered right at the houses of the, system of, of the people. In a way, it also helped in the, the growth of the EMI system as well, especially for uh, sewing machines. Uh, the next slide, please. Now, how Shufu had been dressing up the Japanese women is very important because the modernization of clothes is very much linked to the life improvement scheme that is just Seikatsu Kaizen Undo, the government scheme. A lot of uh, uh, the state people, a lot of educators worked, rallied with the government in order to write the, write the articles which kind of instigated the women to minimize uh, wastage in, uh, in, in clothes because resources were limited. A lot of workshops, exhibitions, and mail order services. Maybe you been... have one more minute, please. Okay, okay. So there were a lot of clothes related articles, starting from children to women, and then to even men as well. Articles uh, started uh, from you know making improvements in Japanese clothes, and then they shifted to Western wear. Uh, it also helped an increase in the penetration of sewing machines. The figures you can see on the slide. The number of uh, advertisements, the number of articles kept rising, and Shufu kind of inculcated in readers love of sewing, which meant modernity freedom, and also dressing up. The next slide, please. We know the love Japanese women have for cosmetics and the fair skin. So magazines, again, played a very important role. Advertising battles kind of increased. There was increased product differentiation, the kind of products market had to offer. The mail order services made it possible for the new, the, the new, the startups, you know, the Japanese startup companies to come in and place their ads. We had seven kinds of foundations in those times and uh, mail order system, the list of advertisements, and the credibility which the products got by featuring the Shufu no Tomo just made uh, cosmetics a part away of modern women Japanese life, which we see to this day as well. The last slide, please. So Shufu no Tomo indeed went about creating a Shufu way of life, wherein not just the Japanese married women, but all the women across Japan led a modern life. A modern life, not just in dressing and you know cosmetics, but a modern life in their attitudes, in their temperament, where Japanese women indeed were the vanguards of consumption, wherein they incorporate modernity in every aspect of life, not the victim, not the dolled up women, but an agency in the consumption, and they were indeed dressed up and on the go. Thank you so much. The last slide, please. That's what the thank you says. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Nidhi. It, is, uh, it was interesting to know the role that uh, Shufu no Tomo played in constructing Japanese women. So thank you very much once again. Now I uh, invite the next presenter, uh, Mayang Sharma. Mayang is a doctoral candidate in the Center for Japanese Studies, JNU. His topic is depiction of Maya in Endo Shushaku's Kukaikawa, a case of Isobe and Kiguchi. Uh, Mayang, please. Thank you so much, Sensei. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, express my gratitude uh, to the organizers, uh, Institute of Chinese Studies and uh, Shivnadar University. So uh, uh, let me just share my screen. I hope it is visible. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, uh, you are visible. Uh, yeah, you are audible. Okay. Yeah, and visible also. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the title of my paper is The Depiction of Maya in Indo Shushaksu Pukai Kawa, the case of Isobe and Kiguchi. So uh, uh, this uh, paper is about uh, Indian philosophical concept of Maya. Uh, portrayed in the novel Fukaikawa, which is also known as Deep River. And uh, the analysis of, uh, is based on the philosophy of uh, Advait Vedanta uh, of uh, Adi Shankaracharya, commonly known as Shankara, uh, focusing on only two characters from the novel, uh, which is uh, uh, who are uh, Isobe and Kiguchi. So the uh, Overview of my uh, presentation is uh, this introduction, Endo Shushak and his philosophy, the concept of Maya in Advait Vedanta, 
and then depiction of Maya through the case of Isobe and Kiwichi, and then conclusion. So, uh, uh, just see. Uh, Fukaikawa or Deep River is the final novel of well known Japanese author Indo Shushak and one of his uh, best and rare works, work of uh, uh, modern Japanese literature, portraying India and various Indian themes. Uh, it also portrays uh, Buddhist, Christian, and Hindu worldviews mainly and uh, deals with the unique spirituality of India, uh, which has served as the basis foundation of Indian civilization for thousands of years. So, uh, uh, in the Indian philosophical system, there are uh, around uh, nine systems of thought, uh, uh, which are Sankhya, Yoga, Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Mimansa, Vedanta, Charvaka, Bodha, and Jaina. So, in this, Charvaka, Bodha, and Jaina is called uh, are called uh, Nastika school. Uh, uh, they reject the authority of uh, the Vedas, while the others accept the authority of Vedas. So the school of Vedanta holds the central position among these, uh, especially the Vedanta of Shankara, uh, which is also known as Advaita Vedanta. Uh, it is uh, considered to be prominent school of thought in Indian philosophical system. Uh, the doctrine of Maya is an essential part of Advaita Vedanta, although the scholars are divided on the fact that Maya is native to the Vedanta or was included later by Shankara and his uh, uh, followers due to the influence of Buddhism. Uh, Maya has various meanings, and in the present philosophical context, it is considered to be illusion by the scholars, uh, uh, which may not be enough to define it properly. So, uh, Endo, Endo Shushak in Fukai Kawa tries to portray Indian philosophical concepts uh, through the characters and plot, and uh, the concept of Maya is one of them, and uh, it is common to both Buddhist and uh, Vedic thought. So, uh, coming to the uh, uh, philosophy of Endo Shushak, uh, so I'll skip some parts. Uh, so uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, Endo is uh, known to have uh, uh, Christian themes and elements, uh, and has extensively written about Christianity in him in his works, and labeled as Japanese Graham Greene. Uh, some scholars say that it is uh, not a good way to deal with his works, and uh, it does not. Uh, uh, it presents a oversimplified picture. And obscures his uh, obscures the elements in Indo Shushak's art that establish him more within the mainstream of contemporary Japanese literature uh, than often acknowledged. So uh, uh, I'll skip this part. Uh, so Endo was uh, converted to Christi Christianity uh, at the age of eleven. So uh, this began a paradigm shift in Buddhist influenced perception of reality to a modern and Western understanding of self world and ultimate and encountered a new system of beliefs, values, and practices. But this shift could not dislodge his Japanese cultural uh, worldview. They described it, it as coexistence of his two selves, the Japanese self and the Western or Christian self. This led to a conflict within himself, uh, but he could not aban abandon any of his selves. Uh, prominent Japanese philosopher Sengaku Maeda suggests that Endo was a Catholic author uh, who was supposed to be unrelated or even at odds with the ideas of Karman and Sansara. But strangely, he introduced the motif of Sansara, uh, which is also uh, death and rebirth, uh, as the main topic of his novel, Fukaikawa. He says further that Karman and Sansara were still alive at the bottom of the mind of Japanese Christian Endo and had long been a cause of his internal conflicts. And he further emphasized that uh, Pukaikawa was, uh, uh, when Pukaikawa was uh, first published, it was well received, uh, received by many Japanese uh, readers. The fact uh, indirectly reveals that Indian ideas are still deeply rooted in Japanese mind. And uh, Indian and Japanese people uh, have long been sharing the same sense of spiritual uh, values. Now uh, I'll discuss about the concept of Maya in uh, Advaita Vedanta. Uh, so, uh, uh, the Vedanta means uh, the end of Vedas. Uh, these are the concluding part of the Vedic scriptures, uh, collectively called Upanishads. Uh, so uh, I'll skip uh, some of the parts. Uh, so the philosophy of Upanishads mainly revolve around two fundamental concepts. They are Brahman and Atman. Brahman is cause of this world. It is the absolute. It is something that is unknown and which needs to be explained. Atman 
which exist within us and uh, uh, known in the inner self of man. Uh, the unity of uh, Brahman and Atman is uh, emphasized by Shankara in Vivek Chodamani. He says that uh, uh, until and unless we do not realize the unity of Brahman and Atman, uh, we cannot attain salvation. This is the basis of Advaita, the non-duality of the Brahman and Atman, which is also called monism. So uh, many verses are there uh, in his uh, commentaries or the Bhashyas. Uh, I'll skip these parts. And uh, then uh, I'll come to the uh, depiction of Maya through the case of Is Isobe and uh, Kiguchi. So uh, in those last, uh, last major uh, work uh, portrays the story of various Japanese characters who go to a journey to uh, India. Uh, uh, with their personal quest on their minds. The main characters are Isobe, Kiguchi, Numada, Mitsuko, and Otsu. So the first chapter of uh, this novel uh, is titled as The Case of Isobe. Uh, it depicts the story of Isobe, who is Japanese salaryman, always busy in his work. He is a, a typical Japanese uh, husband who was embarrassed uh, uh, to express his feelings openly to his wife, although uh, it is not that he did not love her, it brought him a lot of sorrow when his wife became sick and when it was uh, uh, confirmed by the doctor that uh, she had only few months to live, it was beyond his imagination and comprehension. It never occurred to him that uh, she might die actually. It felt like a dream and it seemed to be beyond reality. It was like watching a movie which uh, uh, when suddenly a new movie was uh, projected, he did not know what is real and what is unreal. He was under some kind of illusion uh, which in the uh, in the uh, definition of Advaita uh, Vedanta is Bhranti. It was the kind of sorrow and pain that he probably never faced before in his entire life. Uh, so he thought that uh, she has gone uh, on uh, on a trip somewhere, uh, and soon soon she will be uh, back, and everything will return back to normal. Uh, the reality was in front of him. Uh, but he was not ready to accept it. He could not let uh, uh, let the feelings go away, driven by the affection or the moha. His delusion or the brahma is one of the characteristics of maya or uh, or one of its gunas called tamas, uh, which is also known as, known as uh, tamoguna, which has the power to deflect the mind. Uh, after the uh, uh, then I'll, I'll go on to the next Mayank, one. you have yes, one more minute, please. Little more than a minute. So please try to, yeah. I'll just go to the conclusion then. Yeah, yeah. So uh, 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 we have seen how the Vedanta philosophy can be relevant to the modern Japanese literature since uh, Japanese and Indian share the same sense of spirituality and uh, shared values. In fact, modern Japan India relation can be partially attributed to the Vedanta thought. The contribution of Vivekananda, Ravinna Tagore, Nakamura Hajime uh, need no new introduction. Even Okakura Tenshin. Uh, who was a scholar dedicated to the development of arts in Japan, had a good relationship with Tagore, and he was inspired by the Advaita philosophy, uh, which was advocated by Vivekananda. Uh, the Advaita, the philosophy of Shankara, can be the source of getting rid of all the evil of the society. It teaches us about the reconciliation of faith. It says that uh, uh, what is outside is false. Uh, the difference, uh, different uh, identities and individuality is all a mithya or false, because the Atman is one, uh, with the Brahman and is inseparable. For this one has to uh, look inside and uh, know the true self. Maya causes blurring of the eyes which can look inside. It deflects mind and causes uh, uh, various kinds of sufferings using the power of its gunas. The seven deadly sins according to Christianity are also caused by Maya only. But on the other hand, Maya with the power of its guna gives rise to virtues, peace and divine bliss. Uh, the divine bliss of knowing the Atman and finding Brahman Maya, inside oneself. Your time is over. Can you come to yes. the final uh, point, please? Uh, yes, yes. So, uh, uh, so uh, this uh, 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 the, both of these characters came, came out of uh, the spell of Maya. Uh, so uh, we can have the ultimate knowledge by ignoring the Maya, being inside this Leela or the play of God and watching is like uh, Sakshi or a mere witness without feeling it as a real, uh, playing uh, within it, but just as a character of play, keeping the focus only on the Atman, remaining within Maya, but not under its spell, then Maya will, uh, with the power of its uh, Satoguna, will help the uh, help to gain the ultimate bliss or Parmang, and ultimately the Moksha or the liberation. So with this, I uh, end uh,
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayank. Uh, you chose a very elaborate topic. It takes time. But OK, thank you very much for your presentation uh, and your connection to, to prove how the Maya, the concept of Maya is uh, left an impact on Indo Shushaku's uh, Fukaikawa. Thank you very much. Now I invite the next presenter, uh, Cheri Hitkan. Cheri is a master student uh, uh, student Department of Jap uh, Department of East Asian Studies, Delhi University. Her topic is constructing the home world and alien world, understanding North Korea through pro propaganda posters. Ms. Cherry, please. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon to one and all present here. I uh, hope my screen is visible. Uh, yes, Cherry, it's visible. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Uh, so the title of my paper is Constructing the Home World and Alien World, Understanding North Korea Through Propaganda Posters. This paper seeks to understand how North Korean regime visually creates an us versus them identity, the nature and unique characteristics of North Korean communism, and changing perceptions of their desirable and undesirable traits in the populace vis-a-vis -vis socioeconomic changes at home and abroad. Through the study of the Tatu School of Culture Semiotics and Edmund Husserl and Gordon Sonnenson's life world concept, propaganda in North Korea has been analyzed based on Jovet and O'Donnell's method of 10-step analysis. The posters have been divided into home world and alien world, and then analyzed on the basis of characters, occupational differences, emotions, body language, background, social distance, and political symbols. These are my sources. Juche, or self-reliance, which has its origins in Kim Il-sung's 1955 speech on eliminating dogmatism, forms a primary ideological fixation of the North Korean regime. Juche has evolved over a period of time from anti-Japanism of the colonial period to anti-hegemonism during the Cold War to nationalism and since the fall of the USSR as economic self -reliance. North Korean regime's primary goal is to ensure regime survival, which is threatened by the United States' omnipresent military. Since the absorption of East Germany by West Germany and the fall of the USSR, the military threat has translated itself into an economic threat of liberalization, which is seen as the main cause of instability. Propaganda is defined as the de de deliberate systematic attempt to shape perceptions, manipulate cognitions, and direct behavior to achieve a response that furthers the desired intent of the propagandist. Unlike liberal democracies, it is not a pejorative term in the socialist world, as Lenin considered literature as a vehicle to further the cause of the revolution. Following Stalin, it developed into socialist realism, that is, a simple and instructive form of art which inspires people to become the new Soviet man and attain the goals of the revolution. Maxim Gorky defined the new Soviet man as such, the builder of the new world, who bears all hardships for the sake of the revolution and remains optimistic about it no matter how adverse his own life gets. Like Mao and Stalin, Kim Il-sung applied the mass line approach and recognized the importance of propaganda art in furthering the message of the revolution, which should be realistic and nationalist in form. Kim Jong-il further developed the idea by arguing that art must reflect Cha Ju-sung, a Korean independent spirit, with party ideas forming the basis or seed of all art. One interesting digression with Maoist and Stalinist tradition is his claim that class struggle has ended in North Korea, and hence there was no need to portray any negative characters within North Korea. So these are the 10 steps uh, by Jovet and O'Donnell, along which I will analyze the posters. So why posters? The answer lies in this quote. In the arts of representation are found the real origins and organs of social control. What then is a king? He is a king's portrait, and that alone makes him a king. Images are not just known to have a greater psychological impact than the written word, but can be universally understood by literate and illiterate audiences alike. A crucial source of propaganda across time has been posters, which can be produced in large volumes in very less time. Moreover, their ability to occupy personal and public spaces efficiently enhances the outreach of the propagandists. Propaganda posters in North Korea are released by the Mansude Art Studio, which falls under the supervision of the Central Propaganda Machinery, the Propaganda and Agitation Department of the Workers' Party of Korea. The department acts through the Ministry of Culture, State Security Department, and Ministry of Public Security. 
Edmund Husserl defines life world as a landscape where individual consciousness interacts among themselves, leading to the formation of group consciousness. It is here that intersubjective higher order groupings such as nations are formed. A dynamic concept, life world evolves through common experiences and memories, which can be both real and fabricated. Life world consists of a home world and an alien world. Home world or an us, us identity is formed through notions of collective such as shared values and sentiments. The home world is strengthened and defined by an alien world or the other, which is believed to possess traits considered undesirable or abnormal. This is a diagram which shows the home world as the ego culture and the alien world as the alias culture. Now let's see how the North Korean leadership constructs its uh, home world through propaganda posters. The Songbun system defines the class status in North Korea. Unlike Mao, Kim considered intellectuals important for national development and included them among the revolutionary classes. Since 1955, under the Songun philosophy, military has been defined as a revolutionary class. In the poster on the left, the revolutionary classes, peasants, workers, and an intellectual in a well-dressed suit uh, stand shoulder to shoulder. The soldiers stand slightly ahead, signifying the importance of the military. On the right is a 2020 poster during the pandemic. In addition to other classes, health workers can be seen. Interestingly, women are never portrayed as intellectuals. Koreans on both sides of the border believe themselves to be belonging to a common quote-unquote cleanest race who are inherently innocent and childlike. This notion is particularly popular up north. Both men and women appear with unblemished white skin and cherubic faces. Most have short military haircut as too much concern for appearance is considered a bourgeois trait. The starkest feature of North Korea is the centrality that the leader enjoys, which is called the Suryong system. Interestingly, the leader does not appear as a hyper-masculine figure, but possesses a quote-unquote motherly calm. Unlike the Confucian father, who is a figure of authority, the leader is the loving mother and is often seen embracing his subjects, as seen on the left. On the right is a poster of Kim Il-sung depicted in the sun, the symbol of eternity which shows everyone the path. Pre-Confucian traditional symbols are also used to legitimize the ruler, as here the two kims stand on Mount Pictou, believed to be the birthplace of Thangin, the ancestor of the Korean race. Collective socialist construction campaigns such as the Cholema movement of 1953 are also a major source of crafting a sense of belongingness. On the left is a poster of an ideal worker called Cholema Rider, who calls people to let go of laziness and work. On the right is a poster from the time of economic crisis, calling people to contribute to the fatherland from their meager earnings. This 2020 poster shows a happy peasant carrying huge sheaves of crops pointing to prosperity in agriculture. Interestingly, potatoes have replaced rice owing to food scarcity. Uh, now let's have a look at the other or the alien world, which can be divided into the good, the evil, and the in-between. Cuba and China are the good ones. Here, Cuban and North Korean soldiers fiercely hit an American soldier who can be seen carrying a nuclear missile in hand, labeled U.S., this image shows an elderly Korean woman holding a Chinese volunteer soldier in a filial embrace. Women clad in traditional clothes are reminiscent of continuing Confucian femininity. North Korea being depicted as an old lady subtly places it above China, which is shown as a dutiful son. Japan and the United States are considered the evil forces. Uh, here, uh, two North Korean children who symbolize the coming generations vow not to forget the brutality of the Japanese colonial regime, which features in the background. This poster asks North Koreans to never forget American brutality. The Kokopa written on top is the name of an American warship used uh, in the Korean War. An American soldier trying to grab the person appears in his or her eyes, stating that the American threat still looms on North Koreans. The US is challenged through posters depicting high-tech missiles attacking American symbols of state sovereignty, like the Capitol and the Statue of Liberty, as seen here. Though the liberal democratic capitalist regime of South Korea is considered an enemy, the people are considered brothers and sisters. Here, two equally well-fed children from North with a red collar and South can be seen hoping for reunification. The peninsula behind is covered in North's national flag, pointing to North Korea absorbing the South. American military presence in South Korea is a major irritant. Here, a hammer labeled national independence comes from North and breaks free South Korea from chains, which are labeled USA. North Korean communism appears to be a patchwork of both Soviet and Chinese models and yet uniquely distinct. The acceptance of intellectuals, the call to end class conflict, the metaphysical personality cult of the leader, the narrative of the pure child nation, the heavy emphasis on self-sufficiency contradicts Marxism-Leninism and are unique to North Korea. 
So the regime, whose obituary was written eight decades ago, continues to survive, coursing through this us versus them narrative that is best reflected in its posters. The posters do not just reveal how the regime perceives itself, how it wants to be seen by its people and foreigners, its goals, its fears, but also its underlying ambitions, which become crucial to understand in order to deal with it and ensure a peaceful world. Thank you. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Jerry. You have completed your presentation within 10 minutes. So your Thank analysis you. of how the propaganda art played a major role in communicating the ideas of Democratic People's Republic of Korea's government and building us building on us versus them narrative is truly interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, yeah, thank you. Now we move on to our next presenter, uh, Ashna Joy. Ashna is a doctoral candidate, Department of Humanities and Social Science, IIT Metz. Her topic is survival of Mongolian culture under China analysis between Qing dynasties and People's Republic of China. Uh, Ashna, please. Thank you, ma'am. I hope I am visible and uh, my presentation is also visible. Visible, your presentation is visible. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my topic for today's presentation is survival of Mongolian culture under China and analysis between Qing dynasty and People Republic of China. Now in this uh, presentation, there are three main important actors. First one is Mongolians. Um, Mongolians were traditionally known for their pastoral nomadism uh, who moved freely for the pasture and grazing animals. And they're habituated in the steppe vegetation above the Great Wall of China. And the Mongolians were divided in the Gobi Desert. As we see in the map, the above Gobi Desert, we see the outer Mongolia, which is again uh, separated between the Western Mongolia and the Eastern Mongolia. And the, where there are some of the important Mongolian tribes and as well as the inner Mongolians below the Gobi Desert. And other two important actors are the Qing Empire of China and the Ming Empire. Uh, bo uh, both of them, we know China is a, um, a Han dominated uh, populated state, but however, China is ruled both by the Han dynasty and the non Han dynasty. Now, in this presentation, I'll be looking at the relationship between the Mongolian and Chinese culture during the pre Qing period, during the Qing period, and the post Qing period, and finally, we'll be looking into how Chinese culture survived and uh, uh, Mongolian culture declined through the constructivist theory. And as I told before, um, the China was ruled both by the Han and non-Han dynasty. So there's a difference in their method of ruling here. The Han dynasty, like the Han, Tang, Song, or Ming dynasty, uh, the Han group, they prohibited to expand their territory even beyond the Great Wall of China because they know that vegetation beyond the Great Wall is not suitable for agriculture and they cannot devolve from their perceived superior culture notion that agriculture and settled life is superior to pastoral nomadism. There are instances when the Han dynasty tried to expand beyond, beyond the Great Wall, but only met with a failure due to logistical reason. The non-Han dynasty, on the other hand, like Xin Empire or Durjan or the Xing, uh, Xing Empire, they also tried to expand beyond the Great Wall. But however, out of all the non-Han dynasty who ruled China, only the Xing Empire emerged successful in, in, in integrating all non-Han ethnic group into Chinese empire. All the previous non-Han uh, non uh, emperors forcefully imposed Chinese agriculture practices or Chinese culture beyond the Great Wall in order to pray, make their conquest, conquest permanent but become a failure. Their presence beyond the Great Wall and their policies become weak and were defeated by the nomadic empires. The, the non-Han dynasty, it just this is what the Owen Latimore in his uh, book, Chinese in, uh, Inner Asian Frontier, had clearly said that periods of expansion beyond the Great Wall were followed by the periods of retreat. Um, the Mongolians consisted of different tribal groups. As I shown the map above the Gobi Desert, as well as the below, uh, below Gobi Desert, there are several uh, Mongolian groups, and some of them were powerful, who, like Chinggis Khan, were capable to. Um, uh, to follow the same method of a Shingis Khan, but however, they were all, all the different Mongolian groups were embroiled in internal conflict among each other. They had no unity and constantly fought over each other for succession and pa pastoral land. No leader had emerged after the Chinggis Khan to, or Kublai Khan to unify the Mongols above and below the Gobi Desert. 
After the decline of Mongolian dynasty in 1368, Mongolian got drifted into Western and Eastern Mongol above the Gobi Desert. They consistently fought among each other for the individualistic ambition, which led to civil war among the Mongolian groups, which led to mass exodus to Russia and other peripheral territories. Uh, even though several leaders emerged after the uh, Kublai Khan, they could not unify Mongol or re-annex China or reconstruct the Mongol Empire as made during the uh, Chinggis Khan. The nomadic chiefs got embroiled in personal quest to expand their territory and enhance the stronghold, thus creating a discontent and apprehension among other tribes. When, when one, when one uh, Mongolian chief emerged powerful, the other Mongolian tribe became apprehensive about that and they get allied with the Chinese rulers in order to support them to suppress the powerful Mongolian emperor. For example, the Sunga tribe of the Western Mongolian group, which is above the Gobi Desert. So, um, there, so there was no unity among the Mongolian group. So Mongols, there were some uh, powerful Mongolian troops who were powerful till the decline of Ming dynasty in the 1644. Um, during the decline of Ming dynasty, there emerged another non-Han group like the Manchus from the Northeast Manchurian group who were who had also ambition to expand their territory and who had also ambition to conquer, conquer China. The relationship between Mongols and Chinese during the Qing period, um, the Qing dynasty belongs to the Manchu genealogy whose origin lies in the Chinese Northeast in Manchuria. Uh, the Chinese with this superior attitude had a belief that all the peripheral and neighboring regions should be subordinate to China and observe the tributary relationship ritual by deferring to Chinese emperor. In case any neighboring chief emerged powerful, threatening the security of Chinese frontier and universality of Chinese emperor, the whether it's a Han or non-Han dynasty practiced, practiced uh, deceptive strategies like divide and rule policies against the, um, the tribal chiefs. So one of them was the Nurhachi. Nurhachi was the founder of the Xing empire and he was one of the tribal chiefs in the Manchuria who was given social and economic benefit under the Ming dynasty, under the uh, Chinese, uh, China's uh, vassal relationship. He benefited from the vassal state relationship, improved its weapons and finances to fulfill his ambition to conquer China. He declared war against other tribes in northeast of Manchuria and created a single military unit known as banner system. Each banner system became the unit of residence, economic production, and eventually into a national grouping like Manchu, Mongol, Chinese, Tibetan, and Muslims. The Manchu subdued the Mongols and converted them into a banner system confined within a restricted space where the movement in search of pasture were limited. Thus began the gradual erosion of the Mongolian identity. The Mongols at the origin of the Qing Empire, many Manchus hesitated to adapt the Chinese way of life. The Qing Empire knew that if they continued to lead the Manchu style of looting and plundering, they would be doomed to fail or uh, doomed to fail or uh, uh, to rule over the Han majority. During the integration of the Mongolian tribe into the constructed identity of Qing China, not all Mongols accepted the supremacy of the Qing dynasty due to the suppression of their identity, freedom of movement, and maladministration and Manchu official. The Manchu official knew the deceptive strategies of coercion and control through economic inducement, trades, diplomacy, or the war to ensure the loyalties of Mongols, Mong Mongolias. The Zungar Mongols, which is the Western Mongolia above the Gobi Desert, and Qing Empire fought a long war from 1690. That was the, the uh, first war between the Garden and Kangxi Emperor. Um, to 1757 to keep the independent Mongolian territory based on the culture. So out of all the Mongolian tribe, only the Sungar Mongol fought for their independence. Um, the Qing Empire on the other side wanted to ensure peace in the frontier by subduing the enemies who refused to surrender and subordinate. Due to successive raids and non-submission of Sungar to, Qing, um, to the Qing rule, the emperor decided to exterminate the Sungar state. Sungar as a tribe, state or people disappeared and the Sungarian steppe was almost entirely depopulated. The Sungar were the only Central Eurasian people who, unlike Eastern Mongols or any other Mongolian tribe, who had ferociously existed on preserving their independence from Chinese rule. The Qing court began to promote Han settlement in the colonized region to encourage unity among the multinational people under a single leader of the Qing state. Mongolians and Chinese culture in the post-Qing period under the uh, PRC um, the, as I told, the, uh, there are certain Mongolians who were afraid about the Sungar Mongols allied with the Chinese to suppress the powerful one. So after the, in the posting period, the same Mongols, the Kalka Mongols or the, from the outer Mongolian group fought for independence against the Chinese by overthrowing the Manchus and Han official of the Qing Empire. With the support of Russia, outer Mongolia became independent in 1924 and henceforth were never known as Mongolian People Republic. China couldn't intervene in Outer Mongolia to reclaim the territory because of the internal tension. China didn't wholly ignore its interest in the Mongolia. 
um, uh, uh, in, because uh, so as we know, know today, uh, Mongolia's economy is completely dependent on China, where China purchases 80% of Mongolia's export. Now, any political activity such as supporting Dalai Lama's visit to Mongolia or supporting Mongolian rebels in China will uh, affect its economy by imposing high tariffs on its export. Uh, Inner Mongolia became Ashtar, part of the... You yes. have one more minute, please. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the Inner Mongolia became part of China as an autonomous government, guaranteeing their autonomy over its language, education, and cultural identity. Um, um, however, ha uh, however, under Mao years and succeeding government, PRC continued a civilizing mission, uh, eroding the Mong Mongols' autonomy gra gradually. The Chinese Communist Party believed that by culturally assimilating the minorities into Chinese through education, social, economic, and cultural investment, the disparity between civilized China and backward Mongols could, could be reduced. The goal of CCP is to create a unified China under one language, one culture state, adhering to the party goals of the CCP. The Chinese Communist Party had indoctrinated the Chinese people, especially Chinese students and youth, that their culture is superior and civilized. They were made to believe that Mongols and other minority groups were backward who continue to live primitive nomadic lives and lead to civilize them into Chinese living standards. For example, send down youth camp. Uh, this was due to the cultural revolution. They were educated youth of Han migrants to inner Mongolia who function as the government instrument in the process of cultural assimilation. The interaction between the Chinese and Mongols intensified ethnic tension and witnessed political persecution and cultural destruction of the Mongolians. The Chinese conversion of pastoral land into agrarian land only converted grasslands into desertification. Apart from the pastoral land, their language, culture, and lifestyle were also civilized. Even recently, um, they were forced to say that their bi uh, bilingual education is prohibited, man only Mandarin is allowed in these schools. Finally, analysis on survival of Chinese culture and decline of Mongolian culture based on the constructivist theory. Constructivist theory clearly say that creating a state or nation is constituted by human consciousness and idea. It's a set of idea, a body of thought, a system of norm that have been arranged by certain people at particular time and place. So based on this, China, unlike Western countries, has its own unique set of ideas and practices. China was a cultural state. And after the 19th century foreign aggression, they were forced to adapt to the Western concept of nation state. And the, um, so in the post uh, Qing dynasty, the, uh, the PRC and ROC also incorporated the same, um, even though they had anti Manchu feeling, they also incorporated the Qing state as the ideal state. Uh, Ashtar, the, could you please conclude? Yes, ma'am, final slide. The Qing Empire wanted all the neighboring region and people belonging to multiple ethnic groups to owe their allegiance to the emperor. The PRC also expect the same respect and adoration of CCP, the central tenant, because the party is at the center of the state. The Qing Empire and the PRC government encouraged patriotic education to promote their ideologies and uh, belief system. So in the, uh, uh, when the outer Mongolia became independent in inner Mongolia through the civilizing mission and through the uh, population movement, we see Han Chinese represent 79.2% of population based on 2000 national census, where the Mongols only represent 17.1% in the inner Mongolia. So thus China is a constructed nation state in the modern world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashna. Your paper gives a detailed account of China and Mongolian relationship over centuries. So thank you very much. Now, the final presenter of this session is Shreya Mangain. Mam so she is a doctoral candidate, Department of, Japan, Department of East Asian Studies, University of Delhi. Her topic is Korean collaboration and Japanese coloni colonization from 1876 to 1945, a political legacy and assessment. Shreya, please. Good afternoon, ma'am. I'll just share my screen. Yes, good afternoon. Um, is it visible? Yes, yes, Shreya, it's visible. You're audible. So please start your presentation. Uh, yes, ma'am, I'll just start. Good afternoon, everyone. The topic of my presentation today is Korean collaboration and Japanese colonization, 1876 to 1945, a political legacy and assessment. This is a brief overview of my presentation. In modern Korean history, one of the most debated and controversial topics has been the collaboration of the Koreans with the Japanese during the colonial rule. 
Like in colonies such as India, we find that even in Korean Peninsula, many Koreans during the colonial period collaborated with Japanese authorities. Despite the terminology used for such a relationship, we find that the terms collaboration and collaborator is very vague and ambiguous with varied meaning. Examples can be, for instance, Cambridge historian Anil Seal's description of the phenomenon as a slippery term that may apply at any level between acquiescence and resignation. Similarly, scholars who study occupied wartime territories, especially France during the Second World War, have looked at collaboration from a totally different perspective. The relationship between South Korea and Japan is highly unstable despite the signing of the 1965 Normalization Treaty. And a major cause for this unstable relationship is in fact the situation of collaboration that existed during the colonial period. While officially it is assumed that Korean Peninsula was under the control of the Imperial Japanese Empire from 1905 to 1945, this control had begun much earlier since the Meiji Restoration when there were attempts made by the Japanese to dominate the region for strategic security concerns. And there were several events that actually helped cement the Japanese control over this peninsula. Some of them being the 1884, 1884 Capsin coup, the Sino-Japanese War, and even the 1876 signing of Treaty of Kangwan. Eventually, Korea did become a protectorate of Japan in 1905 and eventually was incorporated as a part of the empire by 1910. And the role played by the Korean collaborators of the Chilimpa as they are known in Korea was essential for this effective and esta effective establishment of Japanese control. As mentioned earlier, the definition of a collaborator and collaboration is very vague. Hence, in order to understand the situation of the Chilimpa in Korea, we must look at the issue, not just from the perspective of an occupied wartime territory, but also from the perspective of a colonized nation. For this, we must utilize the viewpoint of Anil Seel and Cambridge scholarship of modern Indian history. According to Anil Seel, there were various reasons why Indians had to collaborate with the British Raj. These motives could be to gain a position of importance or monetary gain, or even the habit of working for any regime, however unattractive it was. And there are several examples that he has stated of collaborators in the Indian context. Despite the various reasonings behind the collaborators to work with the British, what can actually be, uh, what can actually be uh, pointed on is that the collaborators were essential to the British Raj to carry out the day-to-day -day administration in a colony especially in those regions which were no longer under the control of the British or the control of the British in those areas was very shaky. This situation can be better understood from Lord Macaulay's famous quote from the Minute on Education of 1835. Since this, uh, since this phenomenon functioned on the foundations of a patron-client relationship and competition collaboration syndrome, we see that the system was not static meaning that the enemies of the colonizer might turn out to be important allies, like the Zamindars and the Talukdars who became dependable allies of the British after the 1857 revolt. Despite the fact that the Cambridge scholarship's views are no longer subscribed by modern Indian scholars, we, uh, we must understand that the viewpoint of Anil C and Cambridge scholarship is essential to understand the situation of Chilimpa in Korea. The Korean collaborators or the activities of the Chilimpa has to be understood in terms of the ideas of pan-Asianism that have been propagating during this period, as well as even now. Scholars such as Salazar and Spilsman have pointed out that despite knowing the threats posed by the Japanese imperialist ambitions, many Koreans wanted to follow the footsteps of the Japanese as Japan was a model for successful modernization and preservation of national freedom. And therefore, they felt that Japan could be a fruitful model to be emulated to keep the Western intrusion at bay. 
The modern scholarship on Chilimpa has a broad definition on the notion of collaboration, where even the mere contact with Japanese is considered to be a proof of collaboration. However, this is a very problematic definition since it fails to recognize the individual motives and historical context, as well as the mindsets of the people who collaborated with the Japanese. The two discourses, that is, the nationalist and post-liberation discourses, also, uh, also suffer from the same folly. Despite the, these older discourses, we see that in present times, new perspectives have emerged regarding the Chilimpa, which have looked at the historical context, mindsets, as well as the reasonings behind many Koreans going down the path of the Chilimpa. Despite this, we find that the problem of understanding the historical context and situation of the Chilimpa still exists even today. Some examples of the new perspectives are Eran Elibe's essay on collaboration and Helen Kim and Yumi Moon's work on Inchilo. I would like to conclude my presentation by stating that the issue of collaboration and Chilimpa still is a bone of contention in South Korea at present, despite various governments and efforts to try and identify the collaborators as well as their descendants in modern South Korea, nothing much has been made out of it. We find that despite the negative connotations associated with this term, we must remember that the contributions of the so-called Chilimpas or betrayers, as they are also called, was immense. They contributed to improving the society of their fellow Koreans. Thus, this is a complex issue which has to not be linked just with the question of morality. It has to be understood in terms of the historical situations and mindsets of the collaborators at the time. By doing this, we are able to better appreciate the contributions made by these individuals, not only to reform the society, but also to bring about a sense of nationalism in a, in a nation filled with illiterate masses and preservation of their cultural heritage. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Shreya. You have completed your presentation within time lim within the time limit, and it was it is it was interesting to listen to you how the notion of uh, collaboration, uh, the the Korean co concept of Korean collaboration and Japanese colonization within the time frame of. 1876 to 1945 was observed, and how at the present time we can uh, re-examine those concepts once again. So it was an interesting paper. Thank you very much. Now I uh, request the participants to put their questions in the chat box. Meanwhile, I also invite thank Dr. Thank you very much, Shreya. Yeah, I invite Dr. Tariq Sheikh for his comments on the presentations. So, Dr. Tariq, please. Thank you, uh, uh, Gita. And uh, thank you to all the uh, presenters. And I hope all of uh, the audience can sympathize with me that I'm going to try and comment on such a huge, uh, varied uh, session. Uh, and I'm still in awe with the sheer range of presentations that was there in this uh, session. And uh, it's great to see uh, new areas being covered by uh, scholars of East Asian studies, uh, new areas like uh, North Korea, Mongolia, areas which you do not hear a lot uh, about uh, in East Asian studies circles in India. Uh, I'm also uh, very happy to see new sources being used, new uh, kinds of sources being used by scholars, uh, sources like uh, magazines and posters, and not relying on the traditional, uh, you know, age old, uh, just maybe literature and uh, the, you know, old way of doing things. So it's a very good direction that I think East Asian Studies in India is going. And uh, I'm very happy uh, to, uh, comment on these uh, presentations. Uh, Nidhi's uh, presentation, for example, is so uh, refreshing because we hardly 
uh, talk about popular magazines, uh, which are, uh, you know, uh, consumed very widely, and yet we leave them out in our academic discourses. Uh, so it was really a very interesting um, presentation. And uh, I would also love to look at the methodology that uh, Nidhi seems to be using because the sources that uh, Nidhi is using is so interesting. So I'm sure not just me, a lot of people would want to know how you are looking at uh, the magazines because uh, uh, it would also be interesting to, uh, you know, uh, sort of show off the strength of your research because it's so new and so um, unique uh, to show what and how you are looking at the magazine. Are you looking at the real magazines uh, you know, holding them in your hands and looking at it. If you are, how you, how are you coping with the, uh, you know, uh, the pandemic because you are not uh, allowed to travel and you know get hold of uh, primary documents. And uh, what exactly are you? Uh, what is your uh, contribution? Because a lot of these uh, information about the magazines uh, can also be gone. Uh, you know, uh, obtained from secondary literature. But how exactly are you doing it? Uh, I, I'm sure people would be interested in knowing that. And I know 10 minutes is a very short time and it is impossible to include all of that. Uh, but how was Shukuno Tomo different from other magazines, right? Uh, and why, why did you pick this one up? Is it just because it was the most widely circulated or is there something else? Is it some, are, are there differences within women's magazines? Uh, of the same time. Mayan's presentation, uh, again, throws up so many interesting questions because we have always looked at Endo Shusaku as a Christian uh, writer, uh, but uh, what does it really mean to be a Christian writer, uh, to, to be a Japanese Christian? Uh, Mayang, for example, says that, uh, you know, Endo Shusaku encountered Christianity, which is modern and Western, but, uh, you know, uh, maybe we could look at that critically. Is, is it? Uh, is Christianity? Christianity probably is neither modern nor Western. It's very old and it did not originate in the Western countries. It, there was Christianity in Kerala way before there was Christianity in Western Europe, for example. Uh, we are also, uh, it, your presentation also throws up interesting questions about interreligious translation, which is always a tricky topic. And how do we translate concepts of one religion into another. And then there is your uh, Endo Shu Saku being a Japanese is uh, also a Christian and is also talking about uh, a setup in a third country in India. And how do we translate, for example, Maya and Aztec and Nastic? For example, uh, Mayan says that uh, Nastic does not, Aztec and Nastic is not exactly theist and atheist, which is true. It's not the same thing, but we understand that it is the same thing. And uh, so to explain that, Mayang says that, uh, you know, there are many people in the Aztec tradition who also do not believe in God. But then the question comes, what is God? God cannot be translated. I mean, there is no God in the sense of the Christian Western idea of uh, um, yeah, yeah, monotheistic God in uh, Asian religions. So how, how is it a good word? to be used to define Aztec and Nastic or not. You know? So for example, there are, uh, if you translate Kami, you know, Japanese Kami, uh, it becomes impossible to translate it. So Sento uh, Chihiro no Kami Kakushi, the academic award-winning uh, Ghibli animated movie uh, is translated as spirited away, you know, so because there is no uh, translation of that very weird title, Sento Chihiro no Kami Kakushi. Uh, so those are uh, interesting questions that could be uh, addressed. Uh, for uh, Cherry, again, uh, it was like so refreshing to look at posters from North Korea. And uh, you also put it in a theoretical framework, which really uh, interests us a lot. And we could also think, of, I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is that e uh, posters are a very limiting uh, medium, you know, you can either put it on a wall or maybe distribute to people, but it, the reach is quite limited if you consider today's world, where, you know, in India, if 
you think uh, of uh, political uh, propaganda, uh, both from the ruling parties and the opposition parties, we uh, know that people have figured out a very cheap and effective way to do it. That is WhatsApp. So uh, my uh, curiosity is to know about how North Korean uh, ruling party is uh, dealing with the internet and social media and uh, you know I am uh, messaging apps. Are they using that or not? And what is the situation right now? Are they still relying on posters? Uh, or in fact, what is the condition in North Korea with internet? Are they, does everyone have access to smartphones? And we really know so little about North Korea. It would be interesting, but again, I know it's with 10 minutes, you can't do everything. Uh, for Ashna, again, it is an excellent essay on the history of Mongolia and uh, China's relations. And it would be very informative for all of the, uh, those who want to know about the uh, historical relation. But since your paper deals with history, I would like to see some primary sources that you are consulting uh, because, you know, if you're doing original research in, in, in history, uh, you have also to look at primary documents. And that is a very challenging thing because then you'll have to, I don't know if it is a requirement in IIT Madras to uh, uh, study Chinese language. Uh, but even if you do, you have to know Qing period Chinese, which won't be the same as 20th century Chinese. And even more, uh, you might need to read a little bit of Mongolian which is considered one of the most difficult languages in the world uh, to learn. So that is going to be a, a huge challenge. And from for Shreya, you know, this term uh, that you used uh, in, in Japanese, we'll pronounce it as Shinichiha. And I've heard this term so many times in Japan, Shinichiha, and the Japanese people uh, say, talk very fondly about Shinichi people from, you know, people, from Korea who loves Japan. <laughs> uh, but it is very refreshing to hear about it from the other side, which is the first time for me, maybe a lot of people here already know about it. But my question to you would be, if the Cambridge scholarship is rejected, as you said, rejected by modern Indian scholars, the moment you say that, you know, people would ask you, then why are you using it for Korea? What is the reason that people have rejected it? And if it is being rejected, is it fruitful to use it uh, for Korea? But uh, all of these questions aside, I think all of these presentations are very, very interesting, and I thoroughly enjoyed uh, the presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tariq, for your comments, observations, and also suggestions. So I would, uh, yeah, whether the presenters would like to respond to the discussions, comments, Observations, uh, may I ask uh, Nidhi to go ahead first? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Charik, for your comments and for your thoughtful uh, suggestions as well. So I just took a note of the few questions and some of the concerns that you raised. Why Shufu? You know, this was during my master's when I was doing a lot of assignments on newspapers. So I just happened to read about this magazine, Shufu Notomo. And interestingly, the moment I read about Shufu Notomo, I was taken back to my growing up years, you know, when I would see my mother's reading Grey Shobha and Meri Saheli. So this Meri Saheli and Grey Shobha kind of got that, con you know, that connect. And I thought of, you know, reading more about the Shufu Notomo. Apparently, the resources, the literature doesn't talk about Shufu Notomo much, the, prime, the secondary literature. It talks about Shufu Notomo as a magazine which, you know, kind of ran the modern girl image, nothing more than that. So in that case, I physically went to Japan. I saw all the issues of Shufu no Tomo from 1917 to 1939. That is the interwar period. 237 issues of Shufu no Tomo. Physically, I saw them all. Counted the number of pages. Counted the number of advertisements. I'm using the SPSS uh, software to get my data in place. Uh, I have uh, you know, the data for the number of uh, one-fourth page ads, half ads, one-third, full page qualitative, both quantitative. And for the sewing machines, I went to all the sewing machine museums in Japan. And apparently we all think about, when we think about sewing machines, we think about Singer. Uh, but the, the spade work that was done by Shufu no Tomo in kind of making sewing their pastime, one of the national hobbies of Japanese women, I would say, it did not require the sewing machines of Japan, the homegrown sewing machine companies of Japan to really place their ads in Shufu no Tomo. 
because the articles had done everything. And by 1933, Singer was kind of demolished and it was only and only the Japanese homegrown brands which were doing business in Japan who needn't advertise. And for cosmetics also, we only think about Shiseido. Apparently it was not Shiseido, it was a company called Utena. Something like we say Imami in India, okay? Something very homegrown. And the way it ran, you know, amok in the pages, you see the advertisements. The advertisements also is a whole uh, plethora of stories out there. You know, it's a Pandora box when you open. So I think uh, I've managed to get maybe, I think I would say 5,000 pages with me. Physically, I have them. I have around books which talk about all the ar archival advertisements as well. And I think I've answered all the questions. And uh, yeah, so primary material is my magazines. I'm not looking at any secondary stuff. Secondary stuff only for the consumption history and how I can connect it with the magazines of the interwar era. I hope I've answered all the questions. If any is pending, I can still uh, answer that. Thank you, Nidhi. Yeah. Now, may I ask uh, Mayank to respond? Thank you, Sissi. Uh, thank you, Tariq Sissi, for his comments and suggestions. Uh, uh, as far as uh, this uh, uh, Christianity is concerned, uh, what I meant or uh, uh, what other scholars also meant was uh, uh, it was the perception of Indo Susha, uh, not uh, the division of uh, Western or Eastern Christianity, but how he perceived uh, Christianity. Uh, his uh, life was uh, quite traumatic. And uh, uh, also, uh, uh, when he was converted, uh, uh, he, uh, he he felt like it was a traumatic event in his life although later he understood the uh, what was his, uh, the significance of baptism or converting to christianity uh, but uh, before conversion he was a buddhist so his fa family was a buddhist family uh, so uh, first uh, his mother converted to christianity and uh, uh, later uh, uh, after after that uh, he also converted so it, it was influenced by his uh, mother and his uh, aunt who took uh, him to uh, a Catholic congregation and uh, converted him. Uh, there he was baptized. And uh, uh, so uh, Endo, Endo uh, says that, uh, and the various other scholars also agree that uh, uh, although he, he, he did not want to convert or maybe uh, he did not understand uh, uh, what was the uh, conversion or what was the, uh, maybe he did not understand what religion was actually. Uh, so he, he labeled it as a, a, a kind of loose quote that he did not uh, fit the Christianity that he was uh, uh, referring to. Uh, and his worldview before was a uh, uh, Buddhist, uh, or you can say that uh, Buddhist uh, Shinto, hybrid kind of uh, uh, inspired uh, worldview and later it changed to Christianity. So it is completely different from uh, what Shinto or Buddhist says. Uh, Christianity says uh, uh, or the Christianity is uh, about uh, uh, advocates, mon mon monotheistic God. Uh, but uh, uh, Shinto or uh, Buddhism has a lot of uh, uh, deities so it is a pantheistic view of God. So it was uh, about monotheistic, monotheistic, monotheistic view and the pantheistic view of, uh, of the religion that uh, uh, he was talking about and various uh, other scholars also uh, has suggested. Uh, so uh, uh, that was it. Uh, it was not uh, about the, uh, about, uh, about the, 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 the difference of Christianity because the Christianity that he advocates uh, through his characters, even in Fukai Kawa, he has uh, elaborated uh, through his characters and plot that uh, his view, the, the character, one of the character Utsu, uh, he has a, a view of a, a different kind of God, which the Christian uh, Christianity does not believe in. It is uh, some, you can say Asian God, which, uh, which they do not believe in. Uh, so, and about the uh, uh, concepts, uh, I know uh, it is quite difficult to like uh, uh, translate these concepts uh, from one religion or one philosophy to other philosophy. So I have taken uh, uh, the views uh, or the views of other scholars also. 
and also uh, what uh, Endo has written. Uh, although he he must have written uh, through the Buddhist point of view, uh, but also he he also uh, was inspired by uh, Yukio uh, Mishima Yukio's Hojo uh, no uh, Umi. Uh, his third, I think it was the third or fourth part. Uh, that was the first uh, first novel which uh, uh, which uh, which talked about uh, India and uh, theme of India. Uh, yes, uh, my yes, yes, No need yes, to uh, elaborate. Yeah. So yes, you got you got uh, Tariq Sense's point, right? Yes, yes. So when you further, I mean, uh, do you continue with your research, or when you present yes, the final paper, please. Uh, uh, I mean, include all these points, okay? And uh, yeah, now before I go to Cherry, I can see the Professor Shandip Mishra raising his hand. So I will receive his question. Professor Mishra, please. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, my question is uh, actually one question to Cherry, another to Shea. Okay. Because both of them, they have presented on Korea. Uh, Cherry, I really enjoyed your uh, paper. It was really good, well written. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would like to know that uh, since you are talking about visual uh, media, how especially the posters, how they are depicting uh, this home world and alien world in North Korea. So do you see any change in last 70, more than 70 years? Like, is, is there any trend that a certain kind of posters were much more, you can say, prominent in a particular era and some different kind of posters were became popular? and they were used in certain other era. So that would be uh, my question. And with Sreya, I have to say that uh, I think uh, it's a very interesting topic, Korean collaboration, collaborators. So there have been some work, Sreya, about classifying Korean collaborators. Uh, suppose uh, somebody who is, uh, because of his own, uh, her own actually uh, requirement to survive, if he or she, works with Japanese authority, they were not considered to be that bad. But suppose somebody who is basically collaborating with Japanese and then suppressing or say terrorizing or torturing Koreans, then it becomes a different. So there have been some scholarship in Korean uh, history in which collaborators have been classified. So have you come across any such work? Thank you. Yeah, can I ask uh, Cherry to respond, please, and followed by later on uh, Shreya? Uh, thank you, sir. It's a very interesting question. Uh, so, uh, actually, the, ideologically, the regime remains uh, the same because uh, it was that is the whole idea behind the Soryong system that there would be as minimal ideological alterations as possible. So, for instance, Kim Jong Il, Kim Jong Un both uh, recognized the importance of Kim Il Sungism, which is in fact uh, given more prevalence than Marxism Leninism. So, in terms of ideological variations, we do not really see many changes as compared to, for instance, China, when we had. Uh, when we can see uh, drastic changes from the posters that belong to the Maoist period and then uh, those that were uh, that came up during Tang Shopping's period and later on, uh, but one uh, uh, one major and a very interesting change that I noticed was that under Kim Il, uh, Kim Jong Un, uh, he has tried to make the party more uh, popular among the youth, and with that perspective, he has tried to diversify the kind of occupations that uh, are presented in the uh, posters. For instance, I came across a poster where apart from peasants and workers and intellectuals, we can see musicians and filmmakers as part of uh, the, uh, the poster where, which was titled uh, Work for the Nation and Help in De Realizing Juche Oriented Development. So uh, he has tried to diversify it, tried to incorporate it more. Another uh, question, another important uh, change that I noticed was the uh, presence of consumer goods in uh, the posters that have been uh, that has come up recently. For instance, there uh, I came across a poster where a woman was uh, seen surrounded by teddy bears and chocolates and shoes. So uh, goods of consumer value, consumer goods which were considered too bourgeois in the previous era. So in that way, because he has realized that the heavy industrial uh, system is not going to work. So in that way, uh, he has focused more on lightweight consumer based goods so that at least the economy can function uh, based on the consumer goods internally. And another change is the reduced value of the military. Uh, so the whole uh, uh, the whole uh, rationale behind bringing the Songun ideology under Kim Jong Il was to um, uh, to extend his own authority uh, because his father was a great leader in terms of uh, the 
the party and its history. Kim Jong Il was nowhere compared to his father. So uh, there came a, uh, it, he was actually expecting uh, a certain rebellion inside the party or inside North Korea. So in that way, he tried to curtail the influence of his father's peers. And so he relied on uh, the military. And then also there were certain uh, international events because after the fall of the USSR because of which military gained prominence. So he started investing heavily in the military also because he wanted to, uh, you know, place his peers in the in, in military positions. And then he came up with the whole idea of military being a separate revolutionary class, which is very different from what Leninism teaches us. So uh, in under Kim Jong-un, he realized that all these ministry, uh, this military personnel are actually more related to his father and they might not support him. Uh, in the longer run. So he tried to curtail their influence. And so if you look at the economic uh, plans as well, so he uh, basically tries to push uh, the investments to civilian areas rather than military. And uh, this is one of the reasons why we do not Okay, thank you. Thank Cherry, you. Cherry, thank you very much. And now, <clears throat> Now, may I ask Shreya to respond? Shreya, can you respond within a minute? Shreya, please. Uh, yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, Good sir. Afternoon. Uh, so, uh, so when I was looking at the literature, uh, whatever available literature I could find on this issue of collaboration, what I found was that even though the type of classification that you have mentioned, even though it is... Um, present but it is actually very uh, it is still budding it is actually not got as much uh, enthusiasm in korea and what i have actually seen on, and what i have observed is that more or less the classification is more morally biased meaning that uh, the actions of these uh, people are not actually looked at from the point of view of the context the situation the mindset that these people had when uh, for instance when we look at the indian context when we look at the early indian national congress we understand that uh, the primary aim of the moderate nationalists was to uh, type, uh, was to undo the un-british rule in india and that and for that reason uh, they're so uh, if we label them collaborators by the definition the broad definition i have mentioned it, that is present we can say that even they were collaborators and this is a type of uh, moral issue i have felt that somewhere uh, in korea this has become a moral issue rather than an issue which is complex this is a highly gray area we cannot actually classify these individuals whether uh, they were doing uh, whether they were uh, bad people good people because we have not actually looked um, in detail what the context was uh, what the issues was, what they were actually facing, because uh, a lot of the times, many of these individuals were forced to become collaborators. They did not do it because they wanted to, but they were forced to. It could be because of employment issues. They needed employment. So that was one reason why they collaborated with the Japanese. Or it could be like in case of Helen Kim, she wanted to keep Iava open for women because she felt that education for women is a sin is very important it's very essential and it is the only way through which the korean women can gain some form of independence from a patriarchal society so we must uh, therefore understand that uh, mo uh, that these individuals were not acting on moral basis they were acting because of the context the issue the mindset that they were facing so I feel, therefore, I feel that uh, even though the type of classification that has emerged in Korea is more, it's still uh, somehow very morally biased. It is still not looking at the perspective, the historical context of these. I hope that answers your question. So. Thank you, Shreya. I, I think Professor, Rai, uh, Professor <coughs> Mishra will be <coughs> satisfied with your answer. Now I uh, request Ashna to, uh, would Ashna uh, like to quickly respond to uh, the discussion uh, suggestions? Um, uh, as uh, Tariq sir has mentioned regarding to usage of uh, primary sources in my paper, 
uh, actually this uh, topic I chosen uh, because uh, it's not my original PhD thesis paper. I got interested when I read a few of the literature based on my PhD thesis. Um, it, uh, and one of my chapter is Ch China's territorial nationalism. And so where I got interested with the Mongolian, uh, how China is looking upon all the, uh, the old territories and uh, compared to other countries that how China's perceive the territories is very interesting. So that is why I choose the Mongolian topic and completely use secondary sources like books and journals to use this paper. Uh, but however, I try to get the primary sources to write on, uh, on this topic. Okay, okay. Thank you, Ashna. This, I, uh, we, 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 I would like to conclude the session uh, by thanking all the speakers and the comments, suggestions, questions that have come up in this, during this session. I'm sure they will help the researchers for furtherance in their research work. And I once again thank the organizers for inviting me to chair this session with this. I hand over back to Rija. Rija, please. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Kinney and uh, Dr. Shea for your detailed comments on the presentations. And thank you for, uh, to the paper presenters for joining us today. We hope the presenters will incorporate the comments and suggestions before they publish their paper. The video recordings of this session will be available on the ICS YouTube channel. Uh, we shall now have a short break and resume at 3.15 for our final thematic session uh, titled Shape Shifting, Culture and Society. Please know that the meeting room will remain open for the next session. We encourage you to stay back with your audios and videos off. Thank you. 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 Uh, Ranguli, can we do the audio and video check for the next session? I think all the speakers have joined. Uh, Ranguli, can you just... Yeah, let me just... Uh... Should I make you host? Uh, Rangoli, please switch off the live streaming. Susila, ma'am, is it?